Welcome everyone to Peter Peter Real Estate Show. I'm your host, William Morales, and on today's show, I have Dustin Service. He's the business advisor, thought leader, wealth scientist. He is also the host of the Picture of Wealth podcast, where Dustin gives his insights on investing, personal finance, money-saving income sources, tax strategies, and insurance tips to help his audience be great at money decisions. So, Dustin, first of all, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule, and uh, how are you, sir? Thanks a lot for having me, Will. I uh, I haven't done a podcast this year with anyone from the East Coast, from New York, so uh, I'm excited to do this uh, with you. Yeah, well, listen, uh, I'm happy that you took time out of your busy schedule to uh, to be on the show. Um, so first of all, did you know early on that you wanted to be an entrepreneur? Was this something that you were born with? Maybe did you, you got this as you got older or by some miracle it fell into your lap? <laughs> <laughs> well... I would say no, it's a lemonade stand story, you know, from being a kid to having a paper route at eight, um, you know, right from, you know, I had on my paper route, I had uh, 26 houses. So, you know, I was eight years old. I had 26 houses in our little route and there was two houses on my route that were not buying the paper. So this was like one of those papers back in the day where I had to go and collect and you had to like punch the card you know when people that i had to collect every week i had to get you know two bucks from everybody or whatever it was Man. so uh i in, in three years or four years when i had that paper i never ended up selling those two people <laughs> but uh i i met two great friends uh and uh you know they were very supportive but they just said we don't read the paper so that was kind of the start of um entrepreneurship um uh, and then that led to having a golf course job and working with sort of wealthy people from the time i was 12 uh, cleaning golf clubs and golf carts and sort of meeting and seeing who drove what cars and who played you know the car that they drove sometimes was re relative to how many times a week they played golf <laughs> right. and so if you could figure out who the youngest ones were with the nicest car that played the most golf then that was like well i'm going to see what they're up to and so that's that was the early beginnings of sort of what it is today yeah so did you know um or Around that time, maybe as you became a teenager, early 20s, did you realize that a nine to five wasn't for you? You know, was there an aha moment? And not to say that a nine to five job is bad. You know, some people uh, use it to invest in real estate or or invest in the, in the market in general. But did you realize that at some point that a nine to five wasn't for you? I, I don't know. Both my, my mother was a teacher and my father was an executive for a real estate business. Uh, he wasn't a realtor, but he worked for the head offices of a, of a major real estate corporation. So they lived that. My dad used to travel 180 days a year. And, you know, so I was kind of groomed that, you know, to get somewhere in life, or this is how I interpreted it. It wasn't that he directly was saying it to me, but my young vision or what I saw of my father was that, you know, if you want to get somewhere in life, you got to you know, work really hard. You got to meet the right people and you got to just climb the ladder, get a bigger title, climb, climb, climb. And then, you know, at some point in the future, you will be, uh, you know, retired and you'll have more money than the average person. And then that means your happiness is above average person. So that's kind of how I viewed it. Uh, what, what transpired was uh, I, in university, I took um, civil engineering. So I did a diploma in civil engineering, which in Western Canada, in, in British Columbia, the the two year diploma program was uh, you know got your diploma and you you know make maybe sixty thousand a year where I was and then if you move to Alberta, which is where the oil field is, uh, you could make like one hundred ten thousand. So my schooling it was like shortest amount of school, make the most money. So I moved to Alberta right away and and worked at a place uh, at an engineering firm and we used to start work at six in the morning, work till five at night, we would go work out and eat. And then we'd come back at seven and work till 11. So we were, we were, you know, sometimes the way that the hours would work, you could almost clock in, you know, 14, 15, 16 hours in a day. And then we'd, we'd do this for like 21 days in a row. And so, so when did you but, sleep? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah I, I don't know. It, when you're young and, you know, I had a street bike, you know, we just, yeah. raced home, sleep, get up, come back, do it all again. And it was all, it was fun. But what started to bug me after a couple of years was, you know, I, I worked for a wage and it, overtime was great. And, you know, we banked hours and could take vacations. But what bugged me is I figured out if I worked 24 hours a day, there was a cap on how much I could actually make. And so the only way to make more money was to keep getting raises. And so I didn't like that. I didn't like that I could figure out the max that I could make if I didn't go to sleep. So right. That you know, led to, you know, 
saying, is there maybe a different route? And at the time I was, you know, trading, you know, again, this is how crazy it was. You know, this is 21 years ago, but I was 20. I had uh, a condo. I went into the bank and said, I want to, tra- I want to day trade stocks. Cause I was kind of interested in stocks and I was hanging out with these guys that, that were about 10 years older than me and they, they didn't work. They all just traded stocks and bought real estate. So I'm hanging out with these guys and I said, man, I don't have enough money to like make enough on a trade. Like I could make a hundred bucks, but that's not, that's not getting me anywhere. So I went to Scotiabank and I said, Hey, I want to trade stocks. I need a line of credit. And you know, this is how crazy it was back in the day. Okay. They said, uh, yeah, you know, you have reasonable income. We'll give you a $50,000 line of credit wow. unsecured by anything interest only and uh, do with it what you want. And so that's, uh, you know, what I was doing was trading stocks, uh, and, and I lost lots of money, but uh, made more than I'd lost. And people around the office kind of started to notice and say, hey, we have this group benefits RSP plan. And I want to set up, you know, what do you think would be the best fund to pick in it? And so, you know, this is going back to 2002. So out of the out of the tech crash, you know, the market really rallied up to oh, kind of 05, 06, mm-hmm. uh, up to 08, really. Uh, and so people in the office for that first boost out of the tech crash, we're like, oh, wow, our investments are going up. It wasn't because I helped them pick the, you know, the best funds, but it just the market was moving. But I wanted to work with people and I liked finance. So, you know, that led me to leave the oil patch and uh, come back to where I, I'm from and start uh, working in the finance space. Yeah. And, you know, and, and today's uh, topic is a good one. It's basically about wealth planning, especially in real estate. And you know this, Dustin, uh, if you don't get your finances in order, you're not going to be able to buy anything or at least invest in anything unless you're going to do in the stock market where you might be able to get in for 50 bucks. But now we're talking about uh, uh, single family homes or duplexes or whatever. So uh, when you got into financial planning, uh, was there a moment uh, that you saw maybe it was your own finances or someone else's finances that you you realized that you can help people out, especially in the real estate business, uh, to get their financial uh, organization going? And also, uh, part two, when did you start uh, service wealth management? So that's a two questions in one. Yeah, and I'm gonna, <laughs> I'll, I'll reverse them because okay. uh, I started service wealth uh, in 2005. Okay. Um, now, I started in the business in 2005, so it's not actually true. I tar- started with a stockbroking firm because when I was in the oil patch, my vision was I wanted to be a stockbroker and drive a Ferrari. And so that was, you know, my that's a good dream. <laughs> I was a 21 year old self. And so uh, I moved back. I worked for a few months at a stock, you know, penny a penny stock brokerage, which is horrible. It's literally like out of the movies where they hand you the the postal code book and say to phone yeah, these yeah. people. So. Uh, I didn't like that. I moved to a bigger firm, didn't like that for seven, eight months. And then I joined two guys and had my own practice working under two other guys. And so that went on for about eight years. And that, you know, that it's not a secret of the story, but uh, I asked them one day, I said, I want my name on the sign or I'm going to, you know, leave. And so <laughs> Service Wealth uh, was officially born uh, mm. in 2014 as a corporation. Um, but it, it has been around since about, uh, Oh six, Oh seven. Yeah. So that's, um, you know, it's, it's been a, a pretty steady sort of increase in time, but I would say that the, the big epiphany would have been maybe about the same time service wealth was born. Oh, um, 2014, um, we had a ton of fertility problems. Like my wife and I, you know, were five years of, you know, fertility issues and we, had all this stress in our life and uh, and then I started the company and uh, you know, th- th- there was a moment where in our own life, you know, I was born and raised. It's like works first family second. And again, mm. that was never told to me, but that's how I interpreted that yeah. the world worked was that you, if you don't have money, then you don't, you can't provide for the family. So the money and the business is always first. And, you know, so that, that leaked into a lot of my decisions and a lot of my life with my wife and, um, and so finally, we did end up having a child in 2015. And, um, you know, we had, we used to work out together before we had a child. And so um, one day, uh, you know, my wife and I were having some struggles with, the, with, with having a new baby and all that stuff. And I wasn't present and, you know, on and on. Uh, but there was a real issue there where I, I was making work first. So 
I thought, you know, I'm going to do a great thing today. I'm going to uh, organize babysitter at the day at the daycare at the gym, and I'm going to call my wife and say, I got babysitter organized at the gym, and we're going to go work out together. And this is going to be a really special day. And uh, you know, and it was just a very simple gesture. But I thought this would be so great. And she, you know, I phoned her and said, Hey, I got babysitting lined up. She was like, Oh my god, like thanks, like this would be so great. And uh, so four o'clock was was when the babysitter was lined up. And so mm-hmm. at about like four thirty. My office phone rings and I can see in the call display, it's my wife's number. And I answer it in kind of a sexy voice, like a receptionist, you know, oh, a service wealth management. And she's like, did you forget about the babysitting and the, and the gym? Like, why are you, why are you answering the phone? And then she, wow. she was like, I said, oh, my, and I, and it was like, my heart just like my stomach dropped. And, you know, I totally been, you know, this is a classic. This was like. Uh, this is exactly what my wife keeps telling me, but I, I can't even deliver on this. And so that actually scared me. I don't, I haven't cried very much in my life, but that drive home, I was like, kind of, I was more scared that I almost had Alzheimer's. So wow. uh, we, we got home and, you know, we got it all sorted out. But the next day I thought I need a better plan. I, you know, I advise people to put their stuff in place so that they can make better decisions in their life. And I'm not doing it myself. So what is it? And so I built this model that basically says, you know, it's, we call it the spending accelerator. Mm-hmm. So it says, you know, if, you know, you're taking care of all these responsible buckets, and I know we'll get into this later, but if you're taking care yeah. of all these responsible buckets, that if there's any extra money, you purposely spend it. And, and it doesn't mean spend it. It might mean you can work less and make less because you've already satisfied all these buckets and it's automated so that you can really easily make decisions in your personal life. And so, you know, one of those buckets is a real estate bucket. And so real estate I'm passionate about, I believe in, I believe in the market, stock market. Uh, So, you know, there's, you know, we'll get into it, but there's a sleeve there that says, you know, okay, my real estate bucket, if I just do this, this, and this, by the time, you know, 15, 20 years from now, and I can see it happening every year, Mm -hmm. if that is taken care of, I'm not going to worry about more, more, more. I'm not going to worry about like, you know, we, I was, you know, thought that, you know, to get somewhere in life, you got to work hard, you know, really effing hard. Yeah. I don't know how hard, but I just got to work hard. So where's the, where's the end? Where's the end of that? Where is like, you know, just until you like die, you know, well, that doesn't make sense. So that model and the spending accelerator, we, we mapped it out. I met with my accountant. We talked about it. Uh, and that model has come up every year when my wife and I review things. We look, we rejig it, we look at it and say, okay, like sometimes, um, you know, we'll, I'll save a thousand bucks less a month because I need to pay for daycare right. because that helps the plant that helps our, you know, family, you know, function. So again, that's a long winded answer <laughs> about how we help people with a plan. But uh, that's, that's how, you know, this, what it is today it was really born. You know, I, I, I like the story because again, you knew that, you know, you were helping people. And it's funny that, uh, that way, when we're talking with Dustin Service, um, where, you know, you give advice, but sometimes you don't even follow your own advice. Because I do that myself when it comes to like investing. And I tell people, oh yeah, you could, you know, uh, maybe you could use direct mail or you could use websites like, you know, uh, and not to uh, promote any websites because every, you know, everybody's different, but let's say uh, Privy or PropStream, whatever it is. Um, but then sometimes I don't follow it. <laughs> And I'm like, so why am I giving this advice if I don't follow it? I'm not saying that, uh, anything negative about you. Um, so when you're young or you're older, right? Let's say older, like I am, and you want to get into real estate, we're talking about getting uh, into single family uh, houses. What are some of the ways that we could set up our those buckets? Because those, you know, it's funny that you say that because I remember in, in the crash of 08, and I had money in the stock market. At the time, I was work, I was employed with a hospital, and I saw my finances just just go straight down. Um, I did, de- you know, I bought a book, and I decided to have buckets. Talk more about that, because that's pretty interesting. The way you know uh, that you came up with that, because um, not too many people talk about you know having money in different buckets, so to speak. I don't think people really sit back and actually get intentional. Like whenever I ask people, okay, like, you know, you need to implement an insurance plan or some sort of risk management. They say, well, there's no money. We don't have any extra money around. Yeah. And it doesn't take long for me to sit down and go like, okay, well, where are you spending it? So the, the acronym we use is BAM, B-A-M. So it's the bare ass minimum. 
So this is, you know, bare ass <laughs> minimum is your mortgage payment, your groceries, the utilities for your home, maybe, you know, rent if you don't have a mortgage payment. So it's like, if you, for you to exist, you have BAM. And so yeah. th- this isn't the Louis Vuitton purses. This isn't, you know, for me, it's snowmobiling and motorsports. You know, that isn't that. Like, if you were disabled and couldn't move, none of those would exist. You wouldn't travel. It would be just these, these BAM. So getting clear on what BAM is in your life and having a conversation with your partner, because if you have joint bank account and joint spending, both parties need to be part and parcel. If we, I look at my 10 wealthiest clients in, uh, in my, you know, my wealth management side of the business, um, six of them are married to their original spouse. And, you know, maybe that's the kind of people that I attract, but at the same yeah. time, one common thing with all six of them is that they talk about money together. They don't necessarily mm. like one of them usually is more of a driver, but they never leave each other in the dark. So there's always, you know, they're at all the meetings together. None of them come to meet me by themselves. They're always together. So back to BAM, one thing that my wife and I do every year is we print three months of our visa statements. And, and it's, 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 again, it's very intentional that we sit down and at the start of the meeting, everyone agrees that no one is going to get mad at each other yeah. where the money has been spent. And so again, right. if you're hiding something from your partner, then that's a whole nother story. But if you're just open and say, okay, we just need to get quantification on where the money is going. I'm not going to judge where it's spending because my wife thinks that I spend too much on motorsports. She, I think, spends too much on clothes. But, you know, we're 41 years old. We're, there's a cadence. It's not like the, yeah. there's a spastic thing. So we look at the spending and then we go back to, you know, right now it's the perfect time because over the holidays, we set our sort of goals and values and intentions for the next year. And so if in the spending, we look at it and say, okay, well, you know, my goal is to get more healthy or for, you know, listener, you know, your goal could be to get outside more, um, you know, and so when you review your, your finances, if you look at like where the money goes, you've got a $300 a month cable TV bill or Netflix or whatever. It's like, well, you, why do you have the most expensive cable package when you've said you want to be outside more? So could you reduce the cable package down $150 a month? still have good cable and sports and whatever, but maybe don't need all the fancy movie channels mm-hmm. and then take 150 a month, you know, that's 1800 a year. And maybe you buy a gym membership or you join a club, you know, a, a, and a gym that maybe is more expensive than you think you can afford, you know, gyms, you know, traditional gyms are just their prices. You're going down, down, down. And so is the yeah. service. It, you know, in my region, we're kind of like the California of Canada where like gym prices are like 150 a month, but it's, there's a whole, there's all this stuff going on around it. Well, you think, I would never pay 150 a month to go to the gym. Well, no, I, I love paying 150 because that's, that's part. There's, there's a whole bunch of parts to that, that, that right. I enjoy. So for, you know, again, bam is the number one thing that we need to worry was look at your expenses. Where's the money going? Okay. So that's number one. The next step, you know, in the tool, the spending accelerator really simplified. It's imagine a conveyor belt, imagine a machine and out the back of the machine is a conveyor belt. So again, if, if this isn't video, you know, you got a machine and out the back yeah. of it is a conveyor belt. And along the conveyor belt are bins that are sitting, you know, under the conveyor belt. Along, you know, out of the machine comes your income at the start of the month. So let's call it 10,000 a month. So 10,000 comes out of the machine. The first kicker that's going to kick off is say 5,000 for your BAM. So 5,000 falls out of, you know, it's this bucket of money that's been put out of the machine tips over and spills 5,000 into the BAM bucket. And then you've got 5,000 continuing to go down the line. Now, if you say, I love real estate, you know, want to invest in Midwest, Central, wherever US, want to buy a rental house because there's good yields or I read a book or whatever reason, or your neighbor. And you say, I want to buy a piece of real estate. Uh, Okay, well, then we need to save for that. How much do we need? Okay, well, let's put 3,000 a month into that, that, that savings bucket. So 3000 gets kicked off into that. Maybe we put 500 bucks a month into emergency savings. So, you know, you can see as they're going, your 10,000 that came out, we're just kicking little bits off. And so as you go down, there's a few things, there's good insurance because you can have the best, you know, real estate plan, investment plan, whatever it is. But if you can't work, you know, your number one asset listener is your ability to earn an income. Lots of people think their biggest asset is their home. It's not. 
your biggest asset is, you know, if you make 100,000 a year, times that by 20 year career, it's $2 million. If you can't make that 2 million, your plan is gonna fall apart. Right. So having good critical illness, disability insurance, life insurance for your spouse, again, we need to kick off a little bit and pay for that. So on the conveyor belt, there's a bucket for good insurance, kicks off a little bit into that, we gotta pay for that. Then maybe you do dividend stocks or whatever your balanced fund or whatever it is for investments, and then, you know, there's still, hopefully there's still money left coming out the end of the, the conveyor belt. Well, at the end of the conveyor belt, that's going to, you know, there should be some money left coming off and that you purposely spend. You nice. purposely spend that on your life now or give it to your kids or give yourself the permission to, listener, fill in the blank. Permission to get a new car. Permission to upgrade my lifestyle. Permission to travel. Uh, you know, so if it's done right, you've checked off all these responsible buckets along the way and then there's still money left over, great, then stop waiting for retirement and stop over saving is the message that we're trying to get to people. Yeah, no, I, I, I love how you you broke it down with the conveyor belt and the buckets because, you know, that's how I did it. I had, you know, uh, since I live in the city in, in, in New York and I rent, so I had the rent, then I had, you know, cable and all that, the, the the necessary bills, you know, they are there every month. But then I did, you know, a percentage going for education, uh, maybe for entertainment. But here, you know, since we talk about real estate, so if someone is struggling to get that, a bucket going because they don't have maybe the finances or they're in some sort of debt. Uh, in real estate, you always could bring partnerships, right? If you have the right people, if you go to the right meetup group, if you join the right organization, can you maybe talk about partnerships? Like, have you had any type of partnerships that you have dealt with uh, along your real estate career, as well as, uh, you know, talking to other people about maybe trying to form some partnerships and or suggesting, hey, you know, uh, you might have the time, but this person has the money or, or vice versa. Sorry for my long-winded question. Nope, that's, <laughs> yeah, so multiple partnerships in real estate. Uh, again, when I left Oil Patch, I uh, I came back to my hometown. Again, I didn't have a lot of extra money. I had a condo in uh, in Alberta, but when I moved back to to my hometown to start the finance space, uh, I made fifteen thousand my first year. <laughs> so when I moved back, though, I found a piece of real estate, and I thought, you know what? I'm 23 years old. I am going to likely have roommates. So the first partnership I put together was I went and approached my old boss from the oil patch. Again, mm. we used to work insane hours. He knew I was a hard worker. He knew me as a person for a couple of years. And I said, hey, I need to get a place to live. Rent's a waste of money. Uh, I had worked out this big spreadsheet. Again, now that I look at it, it's way over-engineered. But it, the, the, the net net was I bought a three-bedroom townhouse. So I said, I'm going to buy this three-bedroom townhouse. Uh, I'm going to put two renters in it. So I'm I'm going to be the, the, the guy. I'm going to put two people that are going to pay 400 a month. And, uh, and so how I, I, I underestimated how much the townhouse was going to appreciate. Again, this was back in like 04, 05. Yeah. So, you know, things really were shooting up before the 08 crash. But, you know, I said, I'm going to put it. And then I had this metric. I don't know how I ended up at 14% ownership, but he owned 86%. I owned 14, but he had to put the 80,000 up front. Uh, I see. So, and, and he got the 80,000 back first, and then we split the profits 1486. So, gotcha. you know, so for him, you know, relatively low risk, he knew me, I was living in it. Um, you know, so how that netted out is uh, based on if I would have had to pay rent, I probably made like a hundred bucks a month in, in all the stuff. So I didn't pay rent yeah. for the three, four years that we owned it. And uh, so that kind of led to, so now, so the more recently one that I've had is in the last four years, I bought a warehouse, uh, I bought an office building, uh, and then I did a spec house that I flipped. So mm -hmm. in those things, I would say that, you know, if you're, you know, people with money, uh, you know, if they've been an entrepreneurial background are good at analyzing things, but they're lazy and they don't want to find them. <laughs> so if you are, you know, someone who scrolls your phone, you know, while you watch Netflix and you can look at listings and then have a quick calculator to put forth, you know, a, a deal, you can find deals faster and then present those to people. And, and often like I have lots of clients now with, with cash who, you know, are just looking for deals. There's lots mm -hmm. of money around. Uh, and so, you know, you just have to find a way again, 
my presentation to my former boss you know, 20 years ago was uh, just as a one one spreadsheet. And it was just very logically thought out. It's like, okay, what is he going to say for an objection? If I was the partner putting up 80,000, what's my risk going to be? Uh, you know, and how, how is that going to affect me if this doesn't work out? And then what is the potential upside? Yeah. And so there, there's, you know, any of the gurus that talk about real estate, it's like, you find a deal, money will find you. Right. So, you know, again, I don't know if you have any coaching, but, you know, quick, you know, finding a quick calculations that you can, when you're scrolling listings to do like a gross analysis of like, should I even put this on the short list? Cause there's so many things and, and maybe, you know, better than me, but in West, in the Western part of Canada, you know, cap rates and yields and everything have like, you know, people, you know, foreign buyers were buying things at 3% cap. Yeah. That's like, how it is in New York. Yeah. It's like it's, a two or three, 2.5 or, you know, cause I, I have friends, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to control. That's the, no, I have friends in, 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 in the city and we, we, we talk and they, they'll say, yeah, yeah, the cap is uh, like 2%, 2.5, 3. And I'm like, Jesus, you know, you know, other places is 8, 10, 12 or whatever it may be. But yeah, so go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So you're definitely yeah. right about that. That's amazing. Well, so it's hard <laughs> to find, you know, so yeah. like the gross, you know, if, if, you, if you put, uh, you know, you buy something for a million and you rent it for 3,000 a month, that's a, like a 3.6 yield. Yeah. It's like, that's pretty common. Well, you're going to finance it. So your cash, your return on what you put in, it could be more. I, I would profess to say that we, we could be in for some interesting real estate uh, times for this next little while with interest rates I rising. So. I don't know what it's like yeah. in New York, but in, in the West, it's uh, I see it my client block. I see even successful people sort of now scratching their heads going, hey, we had a commercial mortgage on our $3 million building at 2.9%. Uh, the best we can get now is 6.1%. Yeah. So, you know, even they're going, okay, well, uh, you know, that's, that's uh, not good for cash flow if they renew, but a lot of them are re, you know, mortgage brokers are so creative. It's like re amortizing it, keeping yeah. the payment the same, but now their payment time is like way longer. So mm -hmm. I think there's going to be a lot, maybe it won't affect things too much, um, but it will definitely, it's, cha it's changing, which is, uh, which is good uh, for people with cash. And, you know, there hasn't been very many deals I, I haven't found in the last couple of years, but I think we might start to see deals. And so, you know, being patient and making sure you have no cash in a bank account, high interest savings accounts in Canada right now are over 4% uh, wow. for, for nothing, for doing nothing. Uh, so that's big uh, or that's bigger than it used to be. It used to be zero. So. <laughs> yeah, in New York, I think it's zero zero point one percent. So <laughs> yeah, I definitely get that. You know, and 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 I, I, again, I love the way you broke it down, uh, especially now with the market and with the interest rate. Because I think last I looked, which was about a day or two ago, I think it was at six point five percent or something like that. The interest rate, and then I yeah. I've been hearing rumors that now the Fed might raise it again. Um, so you to knock out so many buyers, and and for me, Dustin, I'm more of the creative side. I try to uh, talk to the owners about creative financing, about whether they would consider, hey, you know, right. I'll, I'll meet your price, but if you give me terms, and then turn around and try to get a you know a, a tenant buyer. So ah. Yeah, so that's you know that's the niche I I like to be in, and and I did that with a pro my first property in 2017. I bought it cash, and then I put it back on the market, and uh, I I became the bank. So I love that sort of real estate where I become the bank. I don't have to take care of any maintenance. Um, first of all, Dustin, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. To me, uh, I I love the conveyor belt uh, analogy where the money goes here and there because. I think if people really uh, think about it, they have the money. Now, even if you're in debt, you could still set aside 1%, 2% or whatever, and you're not going to miss it. But again, like you said earlier, hey, if you have a $300 cable bill, come on, man, cut it down. You don't need HBO Max, Showtime, and all that. Netflix might be uh, uh, the one, or I use Tubi, T-U-B-I, yeah. and it's free. I'll deal with the commercials. So anyway, um, talk more about your podcast. Uh, uh, where can we find it? Uh, what's the gist of the podcast? Sure. So it's The Picture of Wealth, and uh, my website is servicewealth.com, and that's S-E-R-V-I-S-S. -S. Uh, the Picture of Wealth podcast is is born out of, you know, successful entrepreneurs who maybe their status is, you know, they only work three days a week and make a half a million instead of working eight days a week and making a million. Yeah, uh, you know, right. these people are, 
you know, people who have, uh, you know, a lot of, they value time off, they value learning and invest in a lot of courses. So the knowledge levels are high, it, but around wealth and around lifestyle. So fitness, finance, and family kind of are mm. the three F's. Um, you know, we're big believers on, you know, spouses that can make decisions together, uh, yeah. you know, will be more prosperous. And one one thing that uh, I just spoke about at a conference yesterday was, is, is uh, Neil Pasricha is a guy who wrote a book called The Happiness Equation. And so I heard of that book. Any, yeah. Have you heard? So he talks about something called spousal influence awareness. And so we call yeah. the acronym SIA and it's applicable to uh, finance and in real estate. And so we say that, you know, if you think of two axes, up and down axis is your happiness. So at the top, you know, is 10% and a hundred percent. So you think of your happiness, how happy are you, right. you know, in the day? Well, I'm happy, you know, about 80% of the time. Okay. And across the Y axis is your wife's happy, or as I say, your spouse, your spouse is your partner's right. <laughs> uh, happiness. So they're happy 10%, 20%. And so you say, well, you know, my partner's happy about 80% of the time. So where those two meet. So if you're happy 80% and they're happy 80%, that means that 64% of the time you both are happy. So mm. that leaves 32% to be that you're kind of at odds and 4% that you're both not happy. So when do you think the best time listener is to have a conversation about a financial or a big decision that needs debating? Not wow. when you guys are at odds or yeah. both frustrated. So that, you know, when you're 60, both happy. Yeah. yeah when that's so 60 percent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, no wonder we have financial, de- you know, friction because we're probably just not aware of what sort of state we're in. Cause I, you know, I come home all the time with ideas and say to my wife, Hey, there's this apartment building over here. I think we should buy it. You know, it's, like last week was a 10 acre piece with a nine bedroom bed and breakfast on it. And I said, Hey, wow. we're going to buy this thing. And she's like, no, like that, that just seems like a lot of work. And so it was like wrong time, <laughs> wrong time to bring it up. We'll just park it. And so, so it's like, instead of being frustrated and pissed off and saying, Oh, she always, you know, I just resent her because I'm just, she never, I agrees with me wrong time. So again, I'll, I'll, you know, as a parting thought, that would be, uh, you know, what the, the picture of wealth is about. Uh, you learn a lot of that kind of technique there. Yeah, sounds good. Um, any books you want to promote or recommend? Be, uh, talk about the other book the, uh, that you just mentioned. And you know you have a book in you, Dustin. I don't know why you haven't wrote at least a, at least 10 by now. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we do have a book. It just uh, literally uh, finished last week. So it's Oh, added. congratulations. Cool. Yeah. We don't have a title, but I think okay. I know what the title is. Uh, and that'll be out kind of in April. Uh, which so we're gonna have to have we're gonna have to have you back on in April to promote the book. I would love to have you back on. Yeah, hundred percent. It's uh, it's again. I like stories. I like uh, learning through story. I'm not a big you know sit down and do all these steps. It's like hey, sh- share with me some someone did something and give me a few nuggets, and that's what the story is about. So okay, uh, there is a book uh, coming out, and we do have a couple courses. You know, one of them is called Net Net Tough, as in okay. like your, what's your net net. Um, and that was born out of, out of COVID times for people mm-hmm. to kind of get organized to help them be able to make big decisions in their life. Because if you can get your finances organized, that that's a catalyst to making better decisions overall. And, and in COVID times, people were quite stressed and there was Trump and there was this and there was that. It just never ends. So now, um, you know, if you're more kind of confident financially, that'll lead to more confidence overall in your life. Yeah, no, sounds good. And if somebody want to get in contact with you, uh, tell us that website again. Yeah, servicewealth.com, S-E-R-V-I-S-S, wealth.com. I'm on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook. Yeah, I'll definitely put that on the show notes. Well, again, Dustin, again, thank you so much for taking time out of your business schedule. I really, really appreciate it. You're welcome, Well, Thank you. Bye-bye.